welcome. Um, from my part, it's an amazing opportunity to be here. Um, I am a Camilla Tuominen and I'm a CEO and co-founder of Emotion Tracker. And our mission is to help everybody how to understand and lead emotions. But why should we talk about emotions? Well, we're here. We, are ha we have actually been talking about emotions here already, in a sense. But let's go deeper. Because emotions are actually energy. And they are the energy behind all of our actions. So when we're talking about these processes or operations, we also need the people to really do them. And there, that is where the emotions come to play. But I know that some of you might be thinking that, OK, hey, I don't want to talk about this, this stuff. It's uh, scary. And you know, I'm used to doing all this linear, logical stuff. And we don't need these emotions. It has been going all OK already. Or maybe some of you might be thinking that, OK, you know, we get all absorbed in emotions, you know, show your anger. That's not leading of emotions. And when you feel something, you just press it down, you know, making this kind of time bomb in yourself. But these are not very wise decisions when we look at the science and research on what are emotions and what kind of power they really are. Let's look at it from person perspective first. So it's not a news that that emotions and emotional intelligence plays a huge part, part in a performance. They have tested in this one over a million people, and have, they have found that over 90% of, of the top performers have also high emotional intelligence. But what is emotional intelligence? I will not go too deep on that, but it is actually your ability to name emotions. So instead of just blocking them away in a, this kind of mess, you have an ability to say, OK, this is fear, this is anxiety, this is enviness, this is enthusiasm. Because when you have more precise name on the thing, then you are more able to say that, OK, that's the reason why I felt that way and behaved that way and thought that way. And it becomes more clear. And this same ability helps you understand other people too. Because emotions are not there by chance. They are actually bringing us information. So we should really learn to understand this language of emotions. But emotions are also crucial for companies, because in this study, INSEAD and Aalto University, they investigated Nokia and the mobile department there. And they, they wanted to know that what caused the huge problems that Nokia had a few years ago. And what they found out was that actually the fear caused all the problems. Because when they interviewed over 50 middle managers there, they found out that fear prevented them from telling the truth to the top man managers. And they then couldn't make the right strategic moves. And in a way, that's really interesting, especially for me, to think that those emotions were not even expressed. The people were silent. So many people think that when we have silence, th then everything is OK. But in this case, especially, it wasn't the right, right thing to think about. And also, when we think about future and what's you know, coming, we see the artificial intelligence. It's here already, and it's coming, and it's helping us with, with all these linear logical stuff. Everything can, that can be done in an algorithm will be done. And it's great, because it's helping us. But it makes us, the work is on the right side of the brain, on the more complex things, on the, our ability to you know, put two and two together to see and listen to the weak signals and really have this kind of 
space in your head to combine these things and have the courage to speak up. And that is emotional intelligence. And as this uh, Harvard Business Review article said, we should really start to concentrate on these abilities, on emotional intelligence, the same way that we concentrate on the technical skills and the know-how skills. The last study I want to show you is actually a study made by Google. This was a great study um, which lasted over five years. And they wanted to know that what makes a great team, because they had amazing teams there, but they wanted to know that what's really the key there. And first they couldn't find anything, because they, the, actually what they found out was that teams are very different, and they, they all were performing very well. But in the end they found that one thing that was in common in these groups was that they had the safety in them, which they called psychological safety. And it says here in beautifully that we must be able to talk about what's messy or sad, to have hard conversations with colleagues who are driving us crazy. We can't be focused just on efficiency. So to have this kind of courage to speak up, just like in the Nokia example, it wasn't there. But I know, <laughs> oh, I might know, but at least when I was in this kind of situation about seven years ago, when I was a management consultant, I thought that, forget about it. I won't do it. Um, there's too much pressure going on. I'm in between these, all these needs. I have to smile for somebody, for example, for clients, but at the same time I had pressures coming down on me. Or the situation could be for the leader too, that you have the owners there pressuring you, but you have to uh, select what you say to your team. And this is the pressure that the people are in often. And there is no time for this emotion stuff. And this is what I decided then, about seven years ago, that forget about it, I will concentrate on this, you know, just to perform. And I drew this already back then. And it worked great. You know, I was like, you know, I have this armor on, and I was just concentrating and doing my stuff. But the problem arose when I went home and to see my three kids and I, I, I noticed that I wasn't laughing as, as much. I wasn't this energy, energy Camilla that I used to be. And that is what the great researcher Brené Brown also says, that we cannot selectively numb emotions. If we numb the painful ones, if we put the armor on, we also numb the positive ones. So again, this is not what we want. As the leaders, we don't want our employees to numb their enthusiasm, their energy, their creativeness, their courage to speak up. And as a individuals, we might ask ourselves that are we willing to skip joy, gratefulness, love, Enthusiasm, those are things that go if you, if you put the armor on. So, what, what can we do? We have to ask ourselves that do we have the courage to look at the emotional climate that's all around us? And because, as I said in the beginning, emotions are energy and they are also information. That are the two things that they are. And the information part is like an envelope. It's, it's bringing us information, and the question is that do we open the envelope? I sometimes think that when I work with companies, that I think that, oh, there are you know, huge amount of emo, uh, these envelopes in the, in the floors that are not opened. Nobody's seeing or listening all that information. And 
as I said in the beginning, that I think that that's the competitive advantage. That's the key to, to really have something that the competitors ha don't have. So we have to ask ourselves, do we have the courage? And Ed Catmull, um, I'm a very big fan of his um, thinking. He's uh, one of the founders of Pixar alongside Steve Jobs, and he has a great book about uh, Creative Inc. And he says that if there's more truth in hallways than in meetings, then we have a problem. So we have to start from reality, from, from okay, what's going on? As we begin with any other area of our lives, we have to know the truth. We have to state it, because as it uh, Keith Cunningham said beautifully in um, Nordic Business Forum a few years ago, he said that nothing can change until the answer is spoken. And we people, we know that you know, there's this one thing that we are not saying. We have this capability to know that, okay, that nobody's saying this. And when somebody has the courage to say it, it releases an ama ama amazing amount of energy. And people get all relieved, like, oh, okay. Somebody said that thing. And then we can start proceeding on solving the problems when we know what the problem is. And with emotions, we cannot order them. It's, it's like I draw this actually in one seminar. And when I was listening to other speakers, I, 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 was, I saw that they were like, saying that, please, yes, innovate, tell me, tell me, and to this employee who was on the other side. And it reminded me about my talk with my 14-year-old son. And I'm telling him, and I want him to share me the, all the information, but I know that he won't tell me unless he trusts me, and uh, unless I have done my work right, because I have, I have to make the bridge of trust with these small actions. And if I have done my work right, he will tell me, and that's my prize. But I cannot just say to him, tell me, tell me. And that's the same thing that actually we people, we are not going to jump there if we feel that, okay, there's a risk of ridicule, that, okay, if I say this, stupid idea, somebody will laugh, or actually in today's work life, it can mean or even that you get fired because you're the one you know, doing all these crazy ideas and then of course there will be troubles. But that's the way to innovativeness, that's the way to greatness, but people won't do it. They're like, mm -mm, I won't, because even though we think that our, this modern man, logical linear, prefrontal cortex is the one who rules. It's actually our old self who is the one who is uh, you know, feeling the fear and seeing if there's a threat. It's the older, wiser one who is not saying us that, okay, this is not safe. Don't say anything. There's a risk. And actually, when we start with emotions, there's a really unfortunate information to you that you have to start from yourself. Because when we are building trust, we have to first look at ourselves. That what if I'm the rotten apple? What if, what if I'm the one who complains all the time about others complaining? Because we are really blind with our own behavior. So we have to you know, put the finger on us instead of blaming others and really have this kind of call with ourselves that, okay, what's going on? Why are you thinking this way? Why are you behaving this way? What are you feeling and why? Because we need this kind of authenticity. authenticity. Because the other people will not trust us if we are not authentic, because we are telling the truth anyway. Because 93% of our communication is something else than words. So even though we think that we say that, okay, innovate, please, innovate, let's let, tell me. But if our you know, facial expressions are sell, telling something else, we are not reliable. Because we have 
over 80 muscles in our faces just to express emotions. And we, we people don't, we are not aware that we are, you know, reading these signals, but we are. And that's the, the place where you say that, oh, it sounds good, but somehow I don't feel right. Because we have felt something. And all these other impulses, little noses that we make, all these are telling the other one that, okay, are you authentic or not? And with emotions, instead of this kind of attitude of blocking them away and, you know, not looking at them, we should be curious. No judgment, just curious. Yeah. All emotions are good. They are all bringing us information. And we should be really in interested that's in thinking that, okay, I'm thinking these are the facts, but okay, this other information comes to me. What do I make of it? And not be in the other end of the spectrum that oh, I'm all perfect, it doesn't affect me, but instead of understanding that, okay, they are bringing information. And really, when you, s you are with other people, maybe your client or your employee or partner, anyone, you see the facts, yes, and that's good, but also listen to the other channel. What is there? Is there relief, trust, is there disappointment, frustration? And don't worry, you don't have to be a psychiatric to, to, to do this thing. You just have to be curious and human, to, just to listen. Because even the listening and appreciation of the other people, it will be a huge thing for the other one. That's already helping a lot. And also, you get hugely important information. And in a way, you could see that, that the behavior that you see, for example, somebody's really angry, that's only the surface. But be curious to see that, okay, what's underneath the surface? Is there anger, perhaps stress, something? And what does it tell me? And try to you know, be curious about that. And this goes for you, for yourself too. That, okay, I feel this way. I'm, I'm in the traffic jam and I'm all angry. Why am I so angry? Is it this traffic jam? Or was it something that happened in, at work already, before? And what was it? Because that is really the thing. And in conclusion, I could say that next time when you have this confusing situation. Try to be more precise and stop the autopilot, because we go on autopilot all the time, and stop and make the intervention that, to say that, okay, something is happening, what is happening? And if we take the example of anger, I'm really angry at something, but maybe you wonder that, okay, maybe, Actually, I'm disappointed. I didn't get the deal that I wanted. And I, it, it's really disappointing. And that, when we change the behavior that, okay, we don't just hide it, but we confront it. Actually, the disappointment is a hu hugely interesting emotion because, because it makes us sad. It takes up a lot of energy. It makes, makes us tired. So, naturally, we then maybe sit down, we put the hands on our heads, and we are so disappointed that this thing happened. What happens is that people that see us, our colleagues maybe, they come and you know, say, Camilla, it's okay, you didn't get the thing, and da, 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 everything is fine. And then they help me to, I admit that I'm disappointment, disappointed, I'm sad, and then they, you know, help me understand the bigger picture, and my perspective starts to widen. And when we look at if the, there's sadness too, sadness has, according to science, two beautiful aspects. It helps us reevaluate the situation. It helps us to clarify our values and rethink the direction. And that is what we need in this kind of disappointing situation. So when we really listen to the emotion, we get much wiser, and we get to the next 
step much earlier than by hiding it. So we conf go from confusion to identifying the names and naming of emotions. We admit and learn that, okay, what, do, what are these emotions trying to tell me? Understand the connections. And then, in the next situation, we are more aware and we prevent situation from escalating. That, okay, I'm not going to shout now. I'm, I, I understand that I'm disappointed and I will behave differently. And therefore, we change really what happens. And the, the, it's more clear what we should do next. This was a quick intro to emotions and maybe how you can use them more wisely in your daily life. I thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, have a great seminar. Thank you. <laughs>